Okay, everybody, welcome to, um, to the 2023 Longenecker Roth Artist in Residence Lecture. Welcome to Viz80. Woohoo! Ow! And welcome to um, our guests have come from off campus and around campus. Thank you very much for joining us. And also thank you um, to the podcast contingent who are watching this um, on the podcast. Okay, so we will begin. Okay, so um, Martha Longenecker Roth was an artist who worked in ceramics and design. She was professor of art at the San Diego State University, and she was the founder of the Ming Mingay Art Museum in Balboa Park. She was committed to art for the many rather than the few, and to breaking down the barriers between fine arts, craft, and folk art. The Longenecker Roth Artist in Residence Endowment was established in 2016 to extend Martha Longenecker's legacy as an artist and an educator. In the spirit of her historic impact on the visual arts in both local and global communities, the endowment to the visual arts department enables us to annually bring to campus an artist of national and international stature with the aim of inspiring our students to broaden the scope, appeal, and range of their art practice, as well as incite exchange with faculty, the campus community, local artists, and audiences. The endowment was made possible due to the generosity of our good friend, Anna Smythe, and um, the support of our dean, uh, Christina Della Coletta, Dean of Arts and Humanities here at UCSD, and um, both of whom we owe a, a lot of gratitude uh, for this program. We also just want to acknowledge the Lair Committee, which is Monique Van Genderen and Janelle Iglesias, um, Cece Moss, and Anya Galaccio. Um, and um, thanks to Ricardo Dominguez, Chair of Visual Arts, and to our amazing staff, especially Nick Leslie, who's really um, supported us in making this possible. Dave. So I am going to turn Oh, well, I'll, I'll come back and turn down the lights. Um, so um, today, we're pleased to welcome our fifth annual Longernecker Artist in Residence series, Madhu, who is going to be introduced by Professor Monique Van Genderen. Thank you. Is this, can you hear me? I have to read this, and hopefully the words don't just melt. Ceres Madhu is a multidisciplinary artist whose work in drawing, ceramics, painting, and sculpture leans into the influences of craft movements in the arts and deftly weaves back out to explore all the issues in art that are not craft related. Our fifth long necker, I know that's a reiteration, Ceres brings her unique voice to this important program of artists working in residence on our campus and amongst our visual arts students. Having gone to UCSD for undergraduate school and Rutgers University for graduate school, Ceres had rigorous training in the conceptual aspects of art making. I met Ceres here as an undergraduate. Our pedagogical influences were David and Eleanor Anton, Alan Capro, Faith Ringgold, Helen and Newton Harrison, Manny Farber, and Ernie Silva after which she went on to explore her art on the East Coast, bringing a healthy amount of experimentation with materials and creating practice that pioneered some of the relevant aesthetics we see in contemporary art today, such as large-scale soft sculpture and manipulations of materials relating to the body beyond pure formal figuration. Ceres is a persistent artist. Her commitment to her creative explorations has been unwavering throughout her life and career. Some of her past exhibition highlights include a New American Talent Group exhibition at the Texas Fine Art Association, which was curated by Catherine Canjo, now director of the MCASD here, a lace biennial curated by Franklin Sermons, um, who went on to LACMA as a curator. Her most recent show is a group exhibition including Amanda Farber, another alum, at Oolong Gallery in Solana Beach. Ceres has been the recipient of the Pew Charitable Trust Artist in Residence Fellowship in La Poule, France, La Napoule, an Anderson Ranch Art Foundation Commission Award, the Pilchuck Emerging Artist in Residence Fellowship Award, and a New Jersey State Council on the Arts Fellowship in New Genres. 
She was given, she has given artist talks and presentations at UCLA in the Women's Studies Department, UC Santa Cruz in the Sculpture Department, the California Associ Association of Independent Schools, the a Gen Art Conference West Coast Symposium in Los Angeles, Cornish College of Art in Seattle, and uh, Henry Clouse Castle in La Poule, France. Her work has been written about in publications such as the LA Times, the LA Weekly, and the journal Open City. From a show at Deep River Gallery entitled Levitating While Eating, one of the first artist-run spaces in downtown LA, pioneered by Daniel Joseph Martinez, uh, David Pagel writes, the LA artist demonstrate, demonstrates that creativity is not a matter of inventing things out of thin air, but of accepting what's at hand. That's a very Menge principle. He concludes with, usually when works of art are made of found objects, they convey all sorts of forlorn associations. In contrast, Madhu's makeshift landscape couldn't be more playful. Dive into my fanciful world, it seems to say. You've got nothing to lose but your dispiriting seriousness and tedious solemnity. Welcome, series. Well, I'm going to fra frame that letter uh, or that paper. Yeah, a little bit. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Now I can, let me go up, up with this, up here. Hi, is this better? Okay. Um, definitely, I got, have to thank the Longnecker Roth Fellowship um, and the staff. Uh, I've had such good interactions with everybody. Uh, Naomi, Amy, Anya, uh, the wonderful Janelle, and especially Monique Van Genderen, who's taking me under her strong, capable, soft wings. I was like, ooh, yeah. Um, and she's made me feel so comfortable here. Um, the title of my talk is Exaltation, Inspiration, and Perspiration. A Postmodern Child Grows Up. And I'm going to be talking about postmodernity uh, as we were all uh, steeped in it, some of us, and moving maybe to another paradigm. And I want to, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in where we're moving, thinking of cultural paradigms, um, and I'll explain as I go. I did want to say, though, um, when I talk about exaltation and inspiration, that when I look at the images of uh, Martha Longnecker, I feel a real kindred spirit. I see the teacher in her. I see the maker in her and the lover of art. Um, and, um, but, you know, she takes it to a whole nother level. Uh, if you can think about in your life, like getting things done. <laughs> um, and uh, she really did. And uh, remember, women were denied credit cards until 1974. So to be an independent woman with your own money to, you know, choose what to do things with is a pretty recent phenomena. And you might think of your mothers a little differently. Uh, 74, like I don't know when they were born, but what? You know, we didn't get credit cards. Um, so that financial autonomy uh, and the freedom, um, you know, it's, it's never been a level playing field. I see in her, and um, I don't want to uh, in any way, um, you know, project too much, but um, the next part of my talk is being moved by art, and your job is to get inspired. You're all makers here. Uh, well, let's get busy finding out what's going to move us, motivate us, and, um, and get us uh, making. Um, I see um, that uh, Longnecker, um, I made a big leap here. That's just how my brain works. Um, she may have a tinge of a syndrome that I fully admit to having. It's a made-up syndrome. It's been debunked. 
but it's a syndrome that was documented in Florence after looking at uh, Botticelli's and all the Renaissance work, and people would get a little weak in the knees, and the heart would palpitate, and sometimes a hallucination, uh, they would faint. And it, so, it occurred so much that, um, and it happened to this guy, Stendhal, that they named a, a sort of a syndrome after him. And uh, I think we all might have a little bit, a little bit of that, some maybe more, some uh, different times in your life. But if you haven't experienced this when looking at some art, uh, you, know, you know, maybe reevaluate your major. Um, so, and he says, everything spoke so vividly to my soul. You know, here's this writer uh, in uh, Renaissance uh, times. Uh, it reminded me of a statue uh, piece, an incredible installation, and I'm going to be going back and forth through art history and craft history, but The Ecstasy of St. Teresa by Bernini in Rome. St. Teresa of Avellio was so touched by God that she was in ecstasy, could not control it, right? Um, it was the power of the idea. And, uh, you know, Bernini so beautifully captures it in marble and metals and her experience of religious ecstasy. Now, I'm not saying that this is how we feel, you know, every time we walk into a museum, but be open to that. <laughs> <laughs> The long spears that Bernini, Bernini is articulating, this kind of radiant um, power, reminded me of a synesthesia, which is another word for when your brain roots sensory information um, um, and, and it manifests in different ways. So, you know, the impact of color, texture, pattern, history, ideas, poetry, comedy, composition, contrast, you know, be open to that. We have sensitive tentacles as artists and antennas, and your job is to, like, keep them healthy and tuned in. So one of, one of the themes in my talk will be about these sea slugs um, and I'm going to always use it as a point where I get to take a breath <sighs> and just marvel at the beauty. So Bernini to sea slugs. Um, all that tentacle action, picking up information. I wanted to talk about uh, a show that I uh, saw that did, in fact, make me weaken my knees. And that is uh, seeing the quilts of G's Bend, uh, this uh, place in uh, Alabama, remote place, uh, this history of quilt making. And um, I saw the show at the Philadelphia Museum in 2008, and I had a reaction. These are um, quilts made by um, uh, starting a tradition with enslaved women living in rural, isolated Alabama. They were trained in the quilt making of the European style, which would have been you know, for the owners of the plantation, and they were left with scraps. The work clothes, um, the bits of fabric, there was nothing to buy you had to do with what you had. And the compositions, the textures, the history of these fabrics um, are incredibly striking. You understand each stitch is made often by a collective, a group of women sitting together. They're 
improvisation that's happening. And I always carry a beautiful book of the G's ben, Ben's quilts with me whenever I travel to art places because it grounds me and reminds me um, that um, how much you can do with so little. And uh, the compositions are just graphically contemporary. And they were made in pre-modernist uh, times. And continued on. In a lot of ways, the quilts are a great example of a postmodern ethos, which is sampling, colliding, reimagining the usefulness of things. I hear you have a sculpture project, which is a, indeed about reconfiguring, making uh, pastiche, pulling things together that may not have once belonged together, and bringing them to a meaningful whole that is transcendent of its original purpose. There's a blatant disregard for hierarchy and authorship. And it reminds us the lie of the linear history, the one direction that the art historical canons look in. Uh, it's hard to look at pieces like uh, and I'm going to get there. This is all quilts, workwear, scraps. Interestingly, they really took off, and that's why I was able to see this show in the museum. And people started to look at them as American treasures. And the history of quilts in Southern uh, African American making is long and rich and uh, ties to the Underground Railroad, and signs, and things that would have meaning to no one but the people who knew. So these were codes. So I asked, how has the black American Southern woman shaped abstraction? How might the chronology of modernist art be retold with the full inclusion of this history and explode exclusionary canons. And this Ellsworth Kelly makes a pretty nice imitation of a G's bend. No, I, you know, no interesting painter taking it all in happened simultaneously without knowing of each other. I find that fascinating. The last slide I wanted to show of them, uh, this community that has kept the tradition going, is interesting because these quilts were so big, and this is what happens with the avant-garde, the new, and now these are being made and designed for Macy's. <laughs> and so there's a line you can buy. And it's just an interesting um, cycle of cultural, material, avant-garde greatness. What's once on the fringe becomes the heart of mainstream capitalism, if it's celebrated. I want to talk a little bit about myself and my work and uh, what do you get when you cross a steel drum, shell Silverstein books, do people know who that is, where the sidewalk ends, the giving tree, okay, New Yorker magazines and curry for breakfast, okay, this is what you get. <laughs> um, my father, I describe myself as a mix of a mix, and looking out there, I know I'm not the only one. And there's a lot of us now. 
Um, my father immigrated from Trinidad in the West Indies in his 30s, and he promptly got my mother pregnant. <laughs> And it's a good metaphor, so as soon as like boundaries are crossed, boom, things happen, you know. Um, my father's parents were also mixed. His father was from India, which there were a lot of Indian, um, and his father's father was, I was told, Afghani. I don't know. I, I never met him. His mother was African Portuguese. And my mother had her own mix, Jewish and Mormon, Russian and Scottish. And this mixes of mixes to me is a nice metaphor for this postmodern condition that I was raised in, born in, made art in, and understood as part of my identity and liberation as as parts that made a new whole that you could never describe but was um, uh, who I was, am. My father and just a little bit of American history, um, when my brothers were born in a segregated hospital in Washington, D.C., he was not allowed to see I have, uh, these were twins, this is Lark. They're identical, but I could always tell. This is Lark. And so when they were born in the 60s, uh, early 60s, he could not visit them in the nursery. So these two little white baby boys were put in the black section of the nursery where my father could visit them. There's lots of stories. Um, uh, and so these two people who basically ran from their pods and safety of community uh, collided, and I don't think it was always easy. This picture of my mother is taken probably 10 years later, and it's amazing what from the 60s to the 70s, the shifts. Um, one of my favorite essays was when I was in grad school, uh, Donna Haraway's A Cyborg Manifesto. And it's a really wonderful essay, and especially when you read it like a manifesto, <laughs> which I did recently, because I thought she said it's a manifesto, so I'm going to read it out loud. And um, she's so prophetic, because she talks about the new raceless, genderless, embracing technology uh, being. And um, she describes the postmodern identity of the cyborgian entity as filled with irony, contradictions, transgressed boundaries, breakdowns, and the politics of a struggle for language. My mother was a feminist before she even would ever call herself that, and I recall her sharing, uh, coming to school and bringing, uh, she was doing a creative writing exercise and she was wearing a sundress and she had hairy legs and hairy armpits and she brought her a guinea pig. <laughs> and I thought, what, what, oh my God, what did she do? <laughs> um, and the guinea pig ran around the room and she said, I want the kids to have this felt experience to write about. And man, did they. Because I was running around picking up the poops, and my mom was a sight. But that was a really great creative writing class. I still remember it. She was my hero that day. Um, and um, I just thought, if I'm going to talk about me and my work, and one thing that you must do as young artists is ask yourself, who am I? What am I made of? How am I new and different from that? Because you are. But let me get to know the context from which I grew.
The mix of a mix has really continued on. My brother, uh, one of them married a, a woman from China, and this is my niece, Lei, Leah, and I feel the West Indianness in her Chinese-ness. I see it all. Um, my other brother married a Peruvian woman, and I didn't have a great picture of Vicente, but um, the mix is continuing. What is race when a family of this? What is nationality? The family is its own gorgeous quilt. I ended up marrying a French Jewish pirate. <laughs> so the Madus have all the continents covered. Um, ah. This um, sort of sense of who am I, what am I, what are we, what is identity, um, came through in a body of work that still kind of resonates with me. And so I only picked work that I felt like kept reverberating throughout my practice, because I've made a lot of work. Um, these hats were um, also sort of painted uh, um, figures with new expressions on them. I kept going and made lots of them and uh, tiled the room. I had people wear the hats as they walked in the room. And it was interesting, the conversations that happened. And everybody left with their own hat. Amazing, the mingling that happened after wearing the hat, uh, the you know mask. Um, we were all more enthusiastic about being together. I put a mirror in the back. That was an interesting exhibit. And um, it reminded me of some ceramic work that I'm doing now, which is this idea of changing the parts of the face, kind of like Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> um, but I would create um, different expressions characteristics, all the while I was getting to know clay. Different kinds of clay, different kinds of glazes. And the faces are kind of, I call them a face game. And I have lots of parts and lots of faces. And that's something I've done recently. Um, this is some work that I picked out for its sort of postmodern qualities. Uh, this is a blanket, spray-painted, pom-poms, reconfigured, stuffed. And I did a series of work like this, but I also did a series of tongues because I was interested in language and the shape and the surface and always balancing conceptualism with a formal tendency. These were my golden tongue of pennies. This is some of that soft sculpture. I left UCSD not knowing how to use many tools. And, uh, but I would say to myself, what can I make? I can sew. I can put canvas down. I can make a pattern. I can stuff that pattern. Later on in my life, I relished adult ed. <laughs> I took screen printing. I took ceramics. I took etching, woodworking. And um, so you, you get it when you need it. Um, these were all about language. This was my soap, dirty words in soap. 
And I would hand these out and ask people to use them and bring them back. And then I didn't want to touch them. <laughs> um, sharing just material exploration, pistachio shells, um, baby clothing, <laughs> and tar. So really looking around me, what was in the kitchen, what was at hand, what can I do with what I have. In LA, we have a lot of uh, interesting landscape to look at. We definitely have the mountains and the beach, but just driving down Hollywood, you also see a lot of uh, um, early in the morning, you'll see furniture. All neighborhoods, I don't know if it's like that in San Diego, but you know, people are coming and going and you know, fast furniture and you'd see a lot of furniture. And I started imagining this furniture as landscapes and elevating them. Um, I've always done a lot of painting. I was a painter mostly at UCSD and I, I kept that going. Um, but uh, this became a piece, a sculptural piece based on some of those drawings where, um, you know, a recycled rug became farmlands. I actually made a lot of this work after reading um, um, I can't remember which book. Oh my God. <laughs> Garcia Marquez. Uh, I think he won the Nobel Prize for it. Oh my God. Anyways, uh, you know, Finding inspiration where you can. Pulling things from curbs, reimagining them. The swimming pool. Interesting, this little boat was one of my first forays into ceramics. And down the street from me, Peter Shire, who's a pretty hotshot ceramicist, had a studio. And at that time, I just knocked on the door and said, hey, I made something out of clay. Will you fire it? And he was like, OK. <laughs> um, but I did start to kind of get interested in uh, this malleable material, and it was popping up in some of my sculptures. Um, cushions, like turrets, with moths that came from it. Rocking chair turned on its side with the seat out, became a great diving board. And I just couldn't get over the fact that this mattress upholstery was just so much like water with those ripples. Again, maybe I'll make this out of clay. A little foreshadowing. I loved finding certain kind of vinyl chair. It was like easy to hose down and because <laughs> it did start to get a little weird. <laughs> like, what am I bringing in the house here? <sighs> There's an ottoman under there. And I started to want to build different kinds of forms, <coughs> paper mache, plaster, looking at ceramic ware from Holland and the palette of Delft. There's a uh, IKEA shelf under there. Rethinking tools. I'm ready for your assignment. This is, I really feel in tune with your midterm. Sculpture. This was a mop, some chains. 
I started collecting cages, like beautiful big bird cages, and my first instinct was to make them not a cage anymore. And so I wrapped them and coated them and gave them different personalities. These were all big cages that became sort of antiquated machines. And this was my sort of real effort to be elegant <laughs> and minimal. Um, but then I had to put that you know, ugly handle on it, I know. But um, no, I, this sort of like looking at form, my sculpture-ness, my sculptor-ness, um, really needed to be exercised with these. And they were um, fun. Sometimes you recycle work that you've made from recycled other things. <laughs> and so that first piece became this kind of superhero of California. Some new work, I'm going to just uh, share some of the early drawings. I was always sort of doing these swirling, beautiful, arabesque doodles. And I do draw a lot in bed. It's one of my favorite places to draw. And I was also teaching art history and falling in love with Islamic art. And I started building these, uh, thinking of the cages, but now wanting to open them up. These started as lampshades. And then I had this sort of wire forms. There's a material called magic sculpt that taxidermists use to replicate bones. It's a two-part putty. Turns out it's very toxic. So where, but I, I created these sort of dangling, ornamental, sculptural pieces uh, for a while. Again, really slightly goofy, slightly elegant was the headline of one of my reviews. <laughs> I called these danglers and um, I wanted to really quickly, for the nerds in the room, talk a little bit about these paradigms that I mentioned. Modernism, sincerity, truth, authority, grand narratives. Think of Einstein, Karl Marx, Freud. Science will save us and has all the answers. The grid, analysis, white hetero male centric power, the railroad, cars, jets, naivete, and also tradition. Modernism as sort of American paradigm, I think it's interesting for you to think about. And then the shift to postmodernism, distrust of all authority, irreverence. Collage, ironic, noisy, all voices heard, boundaries blurring, the internet, appropriation, cyborgs, excess, no truth. There's no truth. Language is all perception based. There's a freedom in that postmodernism, and I talked about my fractured identity being a whole new, whole interesting sense of power to all those voices. But I've been reading about this new sort of way. The thing about postmodernism is it's cynical. It's ironic. It's funny. You know, you get on the internet, and you can see all sorts of things. And then you can click on the war in Gaza, and you can, and it's all colliding. And I don't know how useful that is. Because we have big problems. 
and meta-modernism, I'm just now hearing about it as a paradigm, is saying we have too many big problems to just be cynical, ironic, and irreverent about it. Reconstruction, dialogue, collaboration, and creative paradox. Metamodernism is being described as swinging between modernist and postmodernism, picking out the best of each. We can't solve our problems with snarky criticism alone, although I'm really good in that mode. Metamodernism is filled with oxymorons, ironic sincerity, pragmatic idealism, magical realism. It wants a felt experience. It wants to reclaim the human connection, craft process, and immersive experiences. And this is where we get those Van Gogh projection rooms. <laughs> but it's true. I want to feel something. If I'm going to the mall and to be with people, I want to feel something. And I think we're seeing this now, this drive to get back into material and to feel process, how things are made. Social practice, I think, can be thought of in terms of this meta-modernism. And without knowing, I did my own bit of that. Uh, you know, happenings, public installation nobody knows about, and you're kind of happy somebody actually took some pictures. I silk screened some bags. This was actually on a Halloween. So kids were ready for treats. And it was down the street from me at this one particularly bad kind of fenced in underpass. And I wrote, uh, people need help on the bag. And inside the bag, it's such a bummer, but I, it's a piece of garlic. It's garlic. <laughs> but garlic is one of the most valuable and versatile foods on the planet. It promotes blood circulation and helps maintain and reboot the immune system. I gave a little tutorial on garlic. Plus, vampires and monsters of all kinds hate garlic, sniff, on the pores of mortals. So this was a Halloween installation. Poor kids. This is a, a project that went on for many years, um, and it was part of an art cycle. It was, you could close down the streets, and everyone's riding bikes, and artists had interactive uh, installations, and mine was to take the Christmas tree from that year and like hack off all the limbs and every scrap of fabric from that year, all the things that were just in my sort of immediate, and to start a God's eye and have people join. There were a lot of clay festival activities and immediately you would see amazing things made, and people would just run to jump to play in clay. One of these mediums that brings you together. And um, I used it in my booths, and it was always a favorite. I wouldn't have to do anything. <laughs> I got into painting and ceramics a little more in the last few years. I'm going to quickly show you some images. Um, uh, those are the snails again, those slee slugs. So my painting practice has really been automatic in terms of um, I'm going to paint whatever I feel like with what's around me. What paper do I have? What's paints available? I'm sitting down for three hours. Let's see what happens. Sometimes it would melt into two days, uh, but oftentimes they were quick paintings. For a while, I was trying to do one a day. This, I think, was definitely COVID. Uh, so there was a theme of being sort of carrying your home with you or being. Masks, another theme that keeps coming up in my work playing with inks, 
textures. Random. <laughs> really falling in love with painting again. Most of these are on paper. Some get kind of creepy. When you paint every day, you get some real stinkers, but you also get, you also get some great work um, where you think, oh, I might come back to that. It's a good habit to get into as an artist, just the endurance, the perspiration of making. I'm going to make five hours today. I know I don't feel like it, but I'm going to. And I'm going to do it again tomorrow and the next day. And by the next day, you're going to have something fabulous going. So I used painting as a way to kind of re-fall in love with um, color and form. I played with abstraction. I played with pattern and still life. Some themes would continue. Figurative, which always scared me. I just would jump in and go for it. I love text and humor, and um, this was one of the hottest days of the year, so Herbert is Sherbert. I have a thing about vampires. Sometimes I'll look at a piece and know that it's going to come back in another form. Um, so the painting was really like a colorful sketchbook. Um, but sometimes it was hard to replicate something you got in that fast painting. Um, so I, I came to appreciate their small size. Um, Ceramics has been um, kind of new for me. Um, and this summer, I, uh, it's been about five, six years where I've really like taken this medium on in a different way. But I'm still painting alongside. Um, this was at Oolong, um, which sadly, I don't know if it's around anymore. But um, hopefully, people will open galleries and have show art. That's important for us. But. Um, this cat interested me because it started as a person wearing a cat mask that was wearing a mother mask. So this idea of masks um, keeps coming back. And we made a mask in our workshop. That was good. You guys did a great job. I see some of my mask artists here. Drawing, again, um, this was a series of giving myself an assignment to make a barf drawing every day. And I did those for months. I, I really started to like them. And then so I made a barf bag. <laughs> I'm, uh, it got me interested in ink. And I, I brought ink with me here. We're not in a bubble. As artists, we're aware of this insanity and the cruel world that we exist in. And I think you should acknowledge it occasionally in your work and know that you're, that's part of your context as a human is the history that you're in. I did a bunch of SOS and help paintings. Again, more with ink. My first uh, foray into ceramics was really practical things. I'm going to make something for the house. I'm going to make something my friends will like <laughs> and use. Um, so I did years. I called these uh, 
funky phone keys. You see the little funky phone keys. So it was for your keys and your phone. And I just was learning about clay and glazing and sgraffito, bells and bowls. Uh, this summer, I made a series of nine cats, nine lives. And I uh, was really getting to know how thick can you go with clay. So these are like door stoppers. These are heavy and risky and really playing off just a basic shape and getting to know the beauty of the glazes that I was around. I joined a ceramic studio that's like a gym. You pay a membership, and only four people go. <laughs> and I was one of the four. I'm like, I'm here today. And Jed was like, me too. And Sarah was like, I'm here too. And we're like, we got this whole space. And it was great, because it had all the tools. Occasionally, it would get crowded, but mostly it was empty. So these were some of the cats. I got interested again with how thick can you go? So these are solid. And I blew up a lot of clay. <laughs> but I wanted the weight and the, just the experiment of it. And I've made a lot of these chunks, I call them. Solid. <laughs> Solid clay. So I'm here at the UCSD now working on a body of work about magic and illusion, and um, I, wanna, I want them to be a felt experience, so I'm thinking there'll be smoke coming out of this mouth. Um, I'm hoping to recruit Janelle to do some magic tricks. I heard you're interested in magic, but um, um, the performative aspect of having a show. Um, I'm trying to work thin so it dries, so there's all these sort of parameters, which I, I actually work well with limitations like that. Looking at these sort of tropes of magicians, like the top hat and the cape, brought me to the Gilded Age in uh, America, which um, is like 1880s, you know, early 1900s. And a gilded does not mean golden, right? It's the surface. Um, and but the wealth inequity uh, strikes happening um, and being put down by national guards and very interesting time in our history when major capitalist systems were just clawed in. JP, JP Morgan is that monopoly man, which is also looking like a magician. These are the things I'm reading and interested in. I'll throw on a documentary. We have so much information and then learn so quickly about things. So take your work to those divergent ideas and poke around a bit. You might find something really inspiring. Um, I think I, this was like what was happening today. I am here for two more weeks. Um, something about rings, something about uh, these sort of graphic paintings that are going to be a little bit um, mesmerizing. I hope it all works out. Thanks a lot for being with me today. It's been a good group. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, hello. Hi. I'm over by um, the graduate student studios on Russell Lane, uh, 201. Um, come by. Vigil Arts Facility. Yep. Yep. Um, I have more time now as I'm like putting things in the kiln and just like waiting around a bit. Um, I'm open to chat and share some snacks. Oh, question, yeah.
That's an amazing question. Um, I tend to stay away from purely natural forms because nature is just the epitome of beauty. You know what I mean? So I can't compete with that. Um, so I guess I'm interested in um, combining beauty with the unexpected and sometimes humor. So, um, but the formal quality of your objects that you make, you know, the corners lining up, the tape not bleeding into another part of the painting, the brush stroke that's done twice to make it sit nice on the canvas, that's part of you honoring that beauty, you know. Uh, the craft of your work can be a place to really put that intention. No, I painted them. So I'm painting, I'm painting on the things that I find. Yes, definitely. Oh, yeah, no, those all were all sort of, you know, hosed down, bleached, sun-dried. Um, and I've worked out of, yeah, driveways, garages, and stuff. Um, that painting on things is a big tradition in San Diego. So, um, um, Jean Lau, who is one of my heroes, who I get weak in the knees and then I laugh and then I have those syndromes when I see her work. They, I mean, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, um, so yeah, shout out, shout out to that tradition because uh, I, think, I think I pick up some of that stuff from UCSD for sure. Hmm. Interesting. I think um, I think there's there's trying to a, a transformation is trying to happen. Um, a, a new a new reality. So um, maybe I have to disguise what was there before. Maybe, that's a really interesting observation. I'm just on top of the head right here. But um, I, like, I like that insight. So sculpture people, raise your hand if you're working on a sculpture right now. Boom, ba -da boom, boom. I'm hoping I inspired some new way of thinking about what's around you. And uh, I think I'm gonna call it a night. <laughs> All right, thanks, series, and thank you, everybody, for coming. And um, yeah, what's that? Oh, yeah, when is the open studio? November 17th, what time? It's in the visual arts facility, um, the performance space, and the main gallery. Nick, do you know what time that is? 12 o'clock, and there'll be food. Um, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll announce it again in Viz80 and I'll put it on Canvas as well, okay? So I hope you all come, and um, thank you everybody for coming, and have a great night. <laughs>